With me now for an exclusive Canadian broadcast interview is Chairman of the U.S. House Intelligence Committee, Ohio Republican Congressman Mike Turner. Congressman Turner, pleasure to meet you and welcome you to our program. Thanks for making the time. Vashi, thanks for having me. Last month you wrote an op-ed in, in Newsweek, the, the headline of which certainly garnered a lot of reaction here in Canada. Trudeau, you wrote, not Trump, is the greatest threat to NATO. Why do you believe that? Well, I think, you know, you really couched it in terms of, um, you know, the issue here is that when NATO came together at the Wales Summit and agreed that all countries would aspire and reach a 2% commitment of defense spending, it, it was an agreement. It wasn't a policy debate. It wasn't something for them to go back to and decide later whether or not they would do. It was, it was an agreement. And the countries that have failed to do so have, have not reached really their obligation to the other countries in the alliance. Um, today, as we look to what the threats are to other countries, every country who's not reached that is really failing in their commitment to the others. Now, the United States and Canada have strong uh, relations. I'm here very proud to be in Montreal as part of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly uh, meeting here in Montreal. It's exciting that um, Canada is hosting this meeting. But at this meeting, one of the biggest discussions will be those countries who are failing to, to live up to that Wales commitment of 2%. And, and what, in your view, is the consequence for those allies who aren't in, in the structure within the structure of the alliance like will will anything happen for example beyond i know what you're going to talk about the, the actual threats that exist but like will any is there an, any tangible consequence within nato if you don't live up to that pledge well currently there is not and that's really that the sad part is is that those countries who who see no consequences have just decided not to live up to it you know right now with Russia's aggression in Europe you know Vladimir Putin has openly made statements threatening England he has openly made statements threatening London tomorrow if he decides to attack uh, England or London uh, Canada is not able to rise to its obligations in NATO to help defend England so, so this has been a, a significant issue in this country for a number of years. And over the, the nearly decade-long lifespan of the government, I've asked a variety of defense ministers, you know, why, why we haven't, until this July at least, laid out a plan to get there. And often their response has been to call the target arbitrary and to point to things that they feel are not taken into account. So, for example, the role that we play in leading the NATO mission in Latvia, the training and the resources that are involved in, in something like that. How would you respond to, to that? Well, every country has additional items that they do. Certainly the United States does, Germany does. But I think here for Canadians, they should look just the, to their own performance of their military. You know, the Canadian military has in so many areas, not just in the 2%, in areas where it's just not performing. And the fact that, you know, the Canadian military was going to be fielding F-35s and that that mission continues to be put off means that there are careers of potential, you know, Canadian pilots that will not, never have flown F-35s, where you have... Norway, a country much smaller with much less resources, that will have, you know, had pilots that reach the capabilities of being you know, F-35 pilots and that can go on in the future to con contribute, you know, their expertise of having achieved uh, that that level of of, uh, of expertise. I think there's there's just greatness that that Canada can achieve that that is just being put off, uh, that that is not accomplished when you don't achieve what is that that agreed upon level of 2% spending. We spoke a moment ago about the lack of consequence within sort of the, the structure of the alliance, but the incoming president has, uh, at a, you know, at a multiple different instances, talked about the consequences in his view of allies who do not meet that target. In fact, at one moment during the campaign, even said that, uh, you know, if, if allies don't, that Russia should do or could do whatever the hell, I think that was part of my language, the hell they, they want um, to, to those allies. A, do, do you think that uh, the, the incoming president is serious about that? And B, what would you expect the consequences vis-a-vis -vis President Trump to be for an ally like Canada who is not meeting the, the target? I think his comments are clearly rhetorical, and and the what you're seeing him saying is is you know this this two percent is important. It really does have consequences, and and it has consequences across the alliance. And what he's showing really is is that it's not just theoretical. Every day that that someone in the alliance does not reach that two percent, it has direct consequences to our ability as an alliance to defend ourselves against authoritarianism, to uh, you know the threats that we have to democracies, and so there is a risk 
and that risk is borne across the, in the, the entire alliance by everyone when someone fails to, to reach that 2% as you recognized, which was agreed upon. Do you think there will be, I guess, more specific consequences for Canada? You'll know, as a congressman representing Ohio, how, how important the trading relationship between our two countries is uh, to, to both of us, but in particular because of the, the relative size of our economies to, to Canada. The prospect of tariffs, the prospect of renegotiating NAFTA in 2026 all lay on the table before us. Do you think there is a world in which the incoming president ties our level of defense spending directly to the prospects of free trade with your country? I do believe that as NATO takes up this issue of countries that are not meeting their agreed upon 2%, uh, that, it, that it, there will be some difficulty in the future, uh, in, in part because I do think that 2% number is going to be increased. I, I think that as you look to Russia, as to look to the threat of China, as you look to what authoritarian countries are doing, the fact that North Korea, Iran, China, and Russia are coordinating, collaborating, that that number is likely going to go up. So as part of it, the number increasing and the gap being wider, there's probably going to be a greater discussion as to what is that going to mean for those countries that are not uh, meeting the requirements. And in that, it's probably going to be a very difficult di di uh, discussion for those countries who are failing. Congressman, you've also written that 2032, the, the date by which or the year by which this government has articulated they, they would meet that target is, is too far off. What would not be too far off in your view? Well, I mean, the Wales commitment has been for a, a very long time. You're, you're already past due. Um, so I, I think that the, the problem is is that it's not just really this this two percent number that was agreed to in Wales. It really is just the, the functioning capabilities of of the overall military. I think even if you look at other metrics, uh, the Canadian military needs desperate investment right now to be able to have both its, um, its, its military equipment, its personnel, its training. There are so many different areas of immediate investment that need to occur uh, that the 2% really will be easy to accomplish if you just begin to address the areas in which there's immediate needs for investment. And just one final question on the nature of that threat, uh, as, you have, uh, as you have referenced. You were, uh, in your capacity as chair of the, of the committee that you do chair, you know, one of the first people to sound an alarm over Russia's space-based nuclear threat. This week, uh, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, lowered the threshold for the nuclear doctrine. And I wanted to know, based on your knowledge, your expertise, your experience, how you interpret that. Well, I think um, the, the threat that we're facing from Russia is, is real. The aggression uh, that we're seeing in Ukraine is not isolated to Ukraine. Uh, what Vladimir Putin is doing is setting his sights on the broader uh, aspect of uh, what he has identified as rebuilding the Warsaw Pact, which is a number of countries that are currently in NATO and are, are strong and thriving democracies, including countries that have been incorporated into the EU, uh, only by our having strong alliances in the West being committed to fighting authoritarianism and supporting democracies, are we going to be able to sustain this? As Russia is garnering the support of China, uh, working both to tie North Korea and Iran and their weapons productions to uh, his military aggression, uh, this really is a very uh, difficult time that we're facing over the next two to five years. And it's going to take every nation, including Canada, to, uh, to come to the recognition that we are facing a unified front from our authoritarian adversaries, and it is going to take strong work from our allies to make certain that, that we retain um, a very um, uh, unified front to ensure that we don't face um, broader conflict. Congressman, I'll leave it on that note. I appreciate your time today very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.